This is the Actors and Directing Workshop. Um, this is our first reel out for teens, and so we have lots of people we'd like to thank. We'd like to thank the Ontario Trillium Foundation, Ontario, Youth Line, HIV and Regional Services, Say It Out Loud, Fuse Group, and Peflock, Kingston, Ontario. That's P Flag. P Flag, yeah. Kingston, Ontario. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, did you say who you were? I'm Maddie Ross, Programming Coordinator. Hey, what school do you go to? I go to LCVI. Yes. Shout out. Um, yeah. And I'm Matt Sultan, I'm the Programming uh, and Physical Director of Reload. And uh, we're really pleased to have so many uh, industry people with us today that are here to share their stories about uh, acting for uh, screen or directing actors in particular for the screen. Um, and uh, with us today, our uh, guest moderator is Kelly Deer, and I'm going to give you a little brief synopsis on Kelly Deer. Kelly is a, a self-actualized inner child, desperately seeking her outer adult. By day, she this sounds like the synopsis for Angel. By day, she teaches drama to similarly angst-ridden teenagers. <laughs> By night, Kelly lends her barbish humor and social satire to lecture halls, pubs, and street corners. That's true. Uh, Ms. Deer uses humor and personal stories to raise money, consciousness, and utter hell for social justice, <laughs> human rights, and for those of us too busy oppressing ourselves to have any fun. Truly a marvel, says Dr. Magda Lewis, Queen's University. Please welcome Kelly Deer and our guest. Thank you all for coming. So I'm um, here, obviously, as some, an immense talent, but what we need to do is communicate that to the camera. So what I'd like to do is pretty quickly just have you say who you are and what you do. And then we'll get sort of into the details of what's really important about who you are and what you do. Okay, so we'll start up at the back here, and we'll go down that way and over here. Sure. Okay. Uh, my name is Adam Garnett-Jones. I'm a writer and director in Toronto, and I'm here with a film called Liar. It's screening tonight at 7. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sarah Kolaski, and I'm a producer and an actor, and I worked with Adam on Liar, and um, I'm from Toronto as well. Hi, my name is Nicola Karaya Demude. I'm an actor, and I'm here with Tafar Margarita. My name is Mark Paraselli, and I'm a writer and director also based in Toronto, and my film Kiss Screen last night. I'm Jenna J. Green, I'm an actress, and I'm here for the wonderful Heather Tobin's film, Truth of Acceptance. And I'm Yvonne Goche, I'm a Toronto-based actor, and I'm here with Truth of Acceptance. I'm Kelly Marie Mercer, I'm an uh, actor and director, and I'm with Heather Tobin's Root of Acceptance. So I'm Heather Tobin. <laughs> <laughs> My film's called Root of Acceptance. Um, I'm an independent lesbian filmmaker, I only ever make lesbian films, and I'm based out of Air Barrie, Ontario. My name is Chase Joint. I'm a writer and a director, and I'm also acting in a project that's currently all over the Toronto TTC screens, which I think is why I might be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So they're all kind of doing their, their own thing. Um, so my first question is, what do you think the biggest barrier is to doing what it is you do? So it's challenged by choice. Anyone who'd like to answer that question, go ahead. What's the biggest barrier to doing what it is you do? Funding. Funding? Funding. Funding, funding, funding. <laughs> Would it be fair to have a show of hands and it's all about the cash sometimes? Yeah. Money? Okay. What's, and what's no. the... No? No. What's your barrier? Well, funding, I guess, would be the barrier, but it doesn't have to be about the cash. I don't know. Yeah, I would say for... I agree. I think for... Well, as an from acting perspective, there's a lot of barriers for me to being able to do the work I would like to do that have to do more with sort of social norms and image-related issues. Right. And, even when the funding is there, who's getting cast and what in the politics of that. Right. So is the heteronormative standard a problem in film? Do you face like that sort of pervasive everyone in media is supposed to look this way, act this way, and be this way? So, so do you find that to be a barrier to your work, either for us doing it or, or getting it out? I think it's the opposite. Okay. I think that gives me the advantage all the way. I think making lesbian films when there's only X amount being made in a year in the world is totally the advantage of the niche market. So I think for me it's a complicated sort of balance though because as a trans person and as a passing trans person I can jump into mainstream or passing markets if that's a choice but for me it becomes more um, strategic 
You know, do I want to be out? Do I want to be making work that is strategically and politically queer? Do I want to blur those lines and sort of screw the system from the other side without people knowing? I mean, these are like <laughs> really interesting questions for me, um, moving in and out of sort of niche queer markets and then back into the mainstream. Is, you know, does this become the forward politic all the time? Is it always about identity? Is it always about who I am? Or, you know, is it made that way by other people? You know, I'm not really sure that there's... Well, and on the, on the other side of that, I think one of the things for me that I've noticed is I've, I've been doing a lot of work in the um, in, in gay and lesbian film in the last couple of years, partially because um, I feel like there's more of a freedom to cast women who look the way they look, and there's less of those like, fewer stereotypes around what is sexy and what is beautiful. That being said, as a woman who's in, in a relationship with a man who plays a lot of lesbian roles, that then becomes an issue for some people which really surprised me, which I found very surprising in my experience. It's been a big shock doing sort of a, doing some festival tours and, and how there is a question there for people in terms of, you know, that, that kind of casting. Whereas for me, it's been amazing because it seems to be based entirely on my editions and entirely on my work, right? Um, and not as much on, on other things. Have so. you always asked that? Like, at, like the festivals? I'm not always asked. I, I find it's, it's actually really, big question for me right now in terms of how to approach that because I'm someone whose experience, like my journey with my sexuality is is, is wide and vast and, and personal. Um, I don't have any problem talking about it, but I do wonder sometimes about people getting up, like I've had people get up in groups of 400, in a theater of 400 people and say, well, are you gay or not? I get that experience a lot for my, yeah. my straight actors that it's always the first question, well, are you actually gay? And well, then yeah. the crowd gets all upset, it's like, does it matter and why do you have to ask? Well, that? so that's the thing, because on one hand, my response is, you know, and it was a really interesting moment that I was just at the Palm Springs International Film Festival and someone got up and said, are you gay? and someone else got up and said, e, basically, you have no right to ask her that. And what's interesting is I also play mostly ethnic characters, meaning I play mostly Spanish-speaking characters, like, you know, Spanish, Portuguese, right. Mexican. I'm not Mexican. No one ever asks me if I'm actually Mexican or not. No one ever asks me where my family's from. So it becomes, but also this thing of, like, how much do you, how much does that reverse, then, the stereotypes and the issues? And But, I mean, ultimately, for me, one of the things that I love about working in uh, in the in like for example when I was just at Outfest in LA I was dreading it because I hate all the schmoozy stuff and that but that community is so much warmer and nicer and more accepting than I find in a lot of the sort of stereotypes that encompass the sort of quote unquote straight film uh, film realm so there's all these positive things but then there's an interesting backside to that please an interesting sort of tangent to that um, I sort of got my training while I was at school at UCLA in LA. And LA is an interesting market because it is saturated with not only actors and directors in film, but there is a large queer community. And so I wonder if part of the issues that we face in terms of representation have to do with if you are the only one, if you are the only gay person in an audience where you are, the, this is the first time you've ever seen a trans person in a room or on a screen, then it becomes very important um, to you that that authenticity be played out in certain sure. ways, right? And so I wonder if the politics of location, too, have a lot to do with that. We're in a very, you know, arguably, no offense to Kingston, small town, you know, sure. and yeah. what the types of films that are being shown here might be the only films that people are seeing. And then Absolutely. when you move to Toronto or LA, you know, the, the conversation becomes slightly different. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So if you had some advice for youth about just what we just talked about, so the barriers would be sometimes funding, identity, uh, location, geography, um, the politics of who you are, what you're supposed to be. If you wanted to say something to youth about, you can do this, this is how you could do this, but take a minute and just think for a second about what you would say to a young person. Because I know there's a, there's a couple out here, and, there, and there's one who I know is a, a fabulous young, young man who is, would probably be more successful if he had more advice. Yeah. What just say? I think, I think you have to find your community find people who want to make the type of work that you want to make and start making work with them. You know, like your first film, it's hard to get over the hump of making your first little film because you feel so precious about it, but you know, just just doing it is the most important thing. Who cares if it's good or bad? You know, it's it's just the start. It's not going to be your last film. Um, and But yeah, finding that kind of network of, of support and trying out lots of different roles. You know, you may think you want to be a director, but then you might find you love uh, cinematography, you know, and just finding lots of um, ways to have different experiences and, and experimenting. Yeah. I also think it's important to, uh, if you're writing or directing, to pick something that you're passionate about and, mm -hmm. and not worry about 
trying to appease a certain market or festival or anything like that. If you care about it, you will put you know 100% into it and hopefully be happy with the outcome. I think from an acting perspective too, it's very important if you can do this younger than most of us do, is to start to balance your idea of success in what you do, in the sense that we live in Canada, we live, in, not just in Canada, I mean it's a very difficult industry. And so this idea of marketable success, this idea of, you know, being on TV or being, you know, you need to find ways to, because there's so many things that are out of our control, you know, and I mean, just to speak to my personal experience, I have issues all the time with, you know, we don't, you know, are, are you, are you white, are you Latino, are you too fat, are you too tall, are you too, there's all these things as an actor that have nothing to do with your work. And if you can, for women, I think especially, but for men as well now, if you can start to back away a little bit from the pressures that the industry puts on you from the outside and start to really look at what you enjoy about what you do, how can you be involved more in things that inspire you and things that make you feel passionate. And then you can have that other part of your career that's about money and that's about climbing the ladder, but that you have to have that balance of those two parts of your career. It's mm -hmm. a passionate balance. I'm seeing a lot of head nodding down here, but you haven't spoken yet. So <laughs> like no, I was just agreeing. <laughs> you I think the biggest thing is if you say, if someone says no, say why not? Mm -hmm. Wrong about yeah. it. Yeah, never, never ever take no for an answer. No is not an answer. Yeah, so it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Be willing to act for free at first. Like, I'm not an actor, I'm a director, but um, be willing to do it for free yeah. until you have a beautiful demo, demo reel and find the best projects and just be willing to, you know, work that part-time job until you are. Was it Hilary Swank that did uh, Voice Don't Cry? I believe she was paid, I don't know where I got this, but my gut says I think it's $5,000 she got for that. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's that whole thing about... Did she's not it? regretting that decision. So. <laughs> 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 I don't think any of us are. Moment. No. And I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, when I was in school, uh, one of my theater teachers taught uh, us to make a budget. And any other time I was told, on like if you're doing a business or accounting in any way, you figure out um, how much money you have and then what you can buy, you know, and try to balance it. Um, and he reversed it and he said, "What do you want to do? Like, figure out what you want to do with your life. What do you What do you need?" and uh, find out how to make that much money. <laughs> like, <laughs> make that to sort of like find a way to make it work. But start with what do I want and drive towards what you want and hopefully things will fall into place for you. Because um, I think that was the biggest challenge for me was trying to figure out, okay, really what do I need to survive <laughs> and uh, feel good about myself and do what I want to be doing. And uh, okay, now how do I support that financially? Yeah, that sort of thing. It's a nicer, it's a more positive way to look at things as opposed to I have no money, I can't do anything. Just don't quit. Don't, don't <laughs> let being like twenty grand in debt on your credit card stop. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Just, Ever. Just, Ever. just numbers. It's just money and you can't take it with you. Like do the things you want to do. And it's funny too because I think there's a there's an interesting uh, thing where we you know we tend to be re you know, if you have a passion for something, especially when you're, I think when you're younger, when you're in your 20s, like I'm finding a big difference in my attitude now that I'm in my 30s than in my 20s, partially because of things like that question about finances, where I can now, at 31, say, God, I wish I hadn't worried about that so much. Like, I wish the fear of debt, and I wish the fear of, like, I didn't have to be working two coffee shop jobs and sleeping two hours a night, and I could have lived on, I could have, I could have relieved some of that anxiety, and that there's an element of trust that's necessary that can be very very hard to maintain and I've been working professionally for 15 years and I still find that incredibly hard to maintain that trust but you have to work at that mm -hmm. and believe in that and find a way to maintain that trust throughout your career. Yeah. I would add to you to believe in yourself Yeah. Yeah. because not every, you don't always get that opportunity to have someone believing in you although as a teacher I believe in you. Yeah. I have to. You haven't spoken yet that much. Is there something you'd like to add? I guess uh, yeah like really trust in yourself, trust in your talents, and accept that you are going to get in ruts along the way, and they're going to suck and be low, but just if you keep pushing at it, you keep the ball moving, you'll get out of that rut, and you'll keep going, so just don't give up when that happens. I think you surround yourself with a supportive network as well. So yes. it's, you know, be, be it people in the industry, or your family, or friends, people that actually believe in you as well, and that helps you keep you, when you're in those ruts that, you know, yeah. the auditions aren't coming in, or, you know, you lost this role or that role, or, you know, these people are here still with you saying, just, you know, keep it going, yeah. we have faith in you, so. Do you want to uh, I don't know, that, no, that, that. I always think, the, one of the first things I was ever told 
in about show business was that Barbara Streisand throws up before every time she sings. <laughs> yeah. And to this day, in my 30s, when I like run into the nerves or run into the nose, I think Barbara Streisand throws up every time she sings. <laughs> and somehow, for me, that sort of levels the field. And the other thing I would say is, it, the, like, regardless of the scope, there is always the balance. The story I like to tell is, I was out having a drink after uh, the film that I just did won an award, and I looked at my phone, and I was like, oh, this is great, I'm totally on the top of my game, and I literally received an email from a festival that will rename, remain nameless, where it said, we, th we thought you'd like to know what the audience said about your film. <gasps> and it was like, <laughs> melodramatic, tried too hard. <laughs> so I was sitting here and I thought, well, this is real life, thank you very much. <laughs> Balance. Yeah. Well, I think one of the challenges for actors, too, along those lines, is that, you know, um, the, uh, I remember my brother and I, when he was in his early 20s as a musician, he kept saying, well, don't you have any integrity? Because I'd taken a couple of projects that he thought were garbage and didn't have that. I remember saying to him, like, if you want to do this for a living, and, I, and in that case, I said, wait five years and come back and we're going to talk about integrity again. And five years later, when it, you know, he came back and he sat down in the living room and he was like, I am so tired of being poor. I'm so tired of, he's a musician and he would only do the integrity. And integrity has to be, integrity is so key, but that we also have to kind of weigh out our desire to work and gain experience inside the industry we've chosen, what parts of that industry we want to be a part of. And you know, things like that, things like you know, receiving an email like that. We, we get to decide whether we're interested in what they have to say, right? And sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. We have a choice to say, I'm gonna change this about myself because it's gonna help my career, or I choose not to, you know, be the change you wanna be in the world. But, we, but that there, sometimes we're going to have to sort of pro and con that a little bit and finesse that and, and, and be honest with ourselves about what our goals are and how to achieve them. There's a, a lot of focus, I think, with young artists, especially on you know, saying, you know, go out and do it and believe in yourself and all those kinds of things. I think that that's really good, but it can also make um, young artists really focused on themselves and mm -hmm. to the point where they're kind of blocking out other opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think that the best thing that people can do very often when they're starting out is say yes to every single thing mm -hmm. and help people uh, more than people are helping you. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. Yeah. give more than you get. Yeah. At some point yeah. it has to come back and you can't, I mean, you, I guess you can make films alone uh, in your bedroom, which I've done. Um, <laughs> but they are. Uh, no, it's true. Actually, that was the, the last festival or film that played at this festival a couple of years ago. Anyway. Um, but mostly, you're working with a lot of other people, and it's it's about that community. It's about those networks, um, and uh, it's really easy to make excuses for yourself. I think if you're sitting alone in your room, yeah. thinking about how early you are and how everyone's always telling you. Telling your parents basically. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And also that everybody doesn't have to love you. Like I love that I love that story because it's like, you know, you're winning an award in one place and somewhere else people are like, oh I think it's and it's like, you know what, like you the, the, our job is not for everyone to love us. Our job is to do the best work we can do in the projects we've chosen. And then who loves us and who doesn't is completely out of our control. And we can't marry ourselves to that acceptance. Well, everyone has such different tastes. Exactly. That how can everyone like your film? Yeah. Your film can't be good if everyone likes it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not extreme yeah. at all. Yeah. It's not saying yeah. anything yeah. about yeah. it. Really. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Heather, may I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, because you, you said that you were a director. And the other thing I love that you said was, uh, I'm an independent lesbian, which made me laugh. <laughs> totally. Like, you're not just an independent lesbian. And then the film came out. Really? OK, wow. Um, what does that mean to you? When you say that, I'm meant to be an independent lesbian? Well, that's like filmmaker, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, I, well, what I, I write, and I, I like to camera operate, I didn't write of acceptance, but I did my other two pieces, and so like, I just I like to do it all, besides hold the boom ball and act, right? So, independent as in, like, um, there's me, <laughs> there's me editing in my room later, and just, I don't know, all low, low, low budget, everything I've ever done, so. I think she just likes her name popping up at like several times. No, I mean, <laughs> independent, on, like on your own, you're independent. I'm by myself, but it is me. I like that. I don't know. You don't have to answer to anyone. No, and I can make films, and if no one likes them, it's okay. I'm doing this. I do this. I do this when I think I make a movie. I do. I always just done it to make gay become more okay. Like I, everything I've ever done, I just want to show that there can be lesbian movies, and it doesn't have to always be about coming out or whatever. It just. 
those mean, and now that's happening on its own in the mainstream, mm. and it's, but it's very recent, and it's, but it's, they're never the leads, they're always supporting characters. And, mm. and it's really disturbing on that line, I'm, I'm finding it really disturbing how much people want to call something a gay or lesbian film, mm -hmm. and call it that, and that's what it's about. We're finding that a lot, like telefilm and other, uh, other, other funny it's, lines. It's just a genre, like, well, yeah, it's exactly be. a drama too. Well, yeah, right? well, yeah. Yeah. like in our, in our film, in Margarita, like my character is a lesbian, and yes, there's, you know, she and her girlfriend have a function in the film, at their relationship as a function of the film, and yes, there is a love scene, and yes, there's, but it's not about what I loved about the film when I read it. Was it wasn't about that. It's about a million things, and she happens yeah. to be and gay. Happens to be, that's, yeah, that's, that's but exactly. then it's like every every time I open a program, even at the even at the straight film festivals, it's genre gay film. And when it gets picked up for di distribution, it's it gay on that. Yes, yeah. we'll go yeah. into gay and lesbian yeah. category yeah. and. And it's LGBTQ just like, and that's it. And on the one hand, it's important to be to be you know pushing storylines with featuring gay and lesbian characters because we need that in our culture more, and we need it to be. But but at the same time, it's like when we when we have to put it in a box again, it's just, it's such a tough balance there. Well, I've done two like feature dramas. My first one was it's a coming out story of a married woman yeah. and she meets a girl and falls in love and leaves the husband. Yeah. The, my second film is a concept film about three different realities and destiny. And I just I want it to be a concept film first. Yeah. And just that just happens to be about a gay character. Yeah. So. And why does having a gay character make it a gay film? And why does I have the same thing in that like you know like the the listing for Margarita says Latino gay film. And it's like there's one Latino in it. <laughs> it's a Latino film. And there's two lesbians in it, and that's great, but it's like, I'm sorry, how loud does that make it? Uh, like, is it, are we going to start calling things? We don't call things white straight films. We don't call them like. white this much, the yeah, straight so film. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, exactly, but that's the thing is that that's the norm, so we need to differentiate Absolutely. from it. But my question is, like, I think the real progress will be when we don't need to differentiate anymore. And in the meantime, we do need to push, yeah. but for me, that's the goal. When I mean, it's like in this drama. Yeah, category. Yeah, it's yeah. a drama. It's very good to women have sex in it. It doesn't make it not a drama and make it something else. Oh, it else. makes a drama. <laughs> it doesn't make it a drama. <laughs> does it ever. That, that's very good point. Because yeah. Netflix, when it first came out, used to have a gay film category. They still do. It's still I, I, I know, know. they still do. Yeah. Or what was it called? The lifestyle section of the Blockbuster? Yeah. Remember that? It was called oh, the alternate lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle yeah. section yeah. of the Blockbuster. They used to work in Blockbuster. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> what? what is going on here? Alternate the lifestyle alternate lifestyle section. lifestyle section. And there was like a, a wall, this tiny little wall in Blockbuster. Well, At least they had it. Whatever, props to Blockbuster, because a lot of video stores didn't even have a wall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a real question from a real participant. All right. Just the people in my head. So this is for directors. And uh, the, the words here are sadness, grief, extreme emotions can be quite difficult for an actor to get to that place. So how do you as directors help actors get to that place? Pointing at me. Yeah. Um, for me, the way I approach directing <laughs> um, is friendship. Um, I, I, I like to take, like some people that maybe like to take directing as like, a, I'm the boss type role. I, I like to, on my entire set, just make sure everyone feels equal and playing level ground. And I think that I try to form a strong friendship with all my actors well into advance of ever shooting so that we're on set. They can just talk to me. We can just talk and we can work it through like a puzzle piece and figure out how to get those emotions on camera because we're all together. And many, many takes. Many, many takes. If they need another one, never say no to it. Never be on your time and be on your budget and care about that. If they want another take, give it to them. And hopefully they want them. That's <laughs> my advice for that. Any more contractors? Anyone yeah. else want to add to that? Um, sp space? I mean, I, th I think that the making sets can often be really unkind mm -hmm. places and making uh, for, for scenes that are emotional. I think in general, making the set a, a good place to be and a comfortable place to be. And when Sarah and I have made films together, I remember talking really early on when we were making something, but it's really important to have good food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, have have healthy food and have yeah. everybody like, so that there are people are feeling good on the crew. Yeah. And so yeah. Yeah. Healthy food, food always right. suffers on film sets. Yeah. 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 Pizza always so always suffers on pizza. And pizza. And stuff. And it's, so I think it's, it's, it's all part of the same thing, like creating an atmosphere that people want to be in, that people yeah. Are committed to doing good work and that they can allow themselves to be vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's pretty intimidating with a camera like, in your face and a microphone, it's like cry, cry, cry. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just feel <laughs> something. Yeah. As, as an actor, I think I, I appreciate the, the ability f for a director to get rid of all the extra um, people, places, whatever. Don't have, have them in the first place. Yes. Like, just yeah. get yeah. Just yeah. And, and be uh, considerate of the actor trying to be, especially in the scenes that we had in Heather's film, were extremely intense. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think you asked someone who was holding a boom pole and started chitty-chatting, 
in between the takes and you, you told him to shut up because you just, you can't, you can't come in and out of it like that. And so to have that respect from the director, telling everyone else to respect the actor space, which was, well, was quite sex nice. Sex scenes, sex scenes. Yeah. I would take my actual like um, sound guy, who's always usually a guy, a very strong holding boom pool, and I would ask a girl to hold a boom pool for the sex scenes, just so they would feel more, like two women would just feel oh, more comfortable so without a guy in the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they were cool, they whatever, but I always wanted to give them the option, well, you'd like her to hold it, it's just a sex scene, I'm sure she can hold it. Like, yeah. really. That's really smart though, because that is a problem I find with love scenes, is that it's always, they try to give you space as women, they're like, okay, I mean, it's a it's closed set, but then you're alone in a room with, with a whole one bunch guy of men. that you don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I also think for directors, it's really important um, to, to to just remember that not all actors get there the same way. Yeah. So to have a bag of tricks, to have a bag of tricks sounds sounds concept, <laughs> To have a tools, different tools. Like some actors are physical actors who are going to need to work themselves up in a physical way. Other actors need images. Other actors need help with you know the storytelling and that. So, so to be open to that. And if you're giving the same note over and over again, then what you want to see isn't happening. You're going to have to try something different. You're trying a new way in, yeah. and to be open to that. I honestly think the best directors uh, uh, have tried acting. Yes. yes. Have been there. Yeah. You know and. Either know wholeheartedly that they are terrible at it, or <laughs> it's just totally fine. I do not think you have to be a good actor to be a great director, but I do think um, there's like a body politic to acting that you can get access to only if you try. Yeah, makes and you appreciate it. one of the yeah. best things I ever learned about directing is is to try and place your words in an as if circumstance. So instead of saying I need you to play this frustrated, you say I need you to play this as if someone has just put a you know cup of Tabasco down your throat. You know, and so ways to like incite different kinds of. I immediately started to do that. My mouth is watering. I'm right. Flushed. <laughs> right. Whereas if you say frustrated, everyone does. You know, and it becomes superficial. And it's a problem in our culture, I think, in the we're not just our culture, but in the way that we um, teach film acting and directing. Because first of all, we don't generally, yeah. and people are doing it on their own a lot. But also, like, I mean, for and this is not a plug for the school, but I teach at Ryerson University. I teach a course called directing screen performance, and directing screen performance is taught by an actor. I, and I, what I do is I teach people who want to be directors different ways that actors go through a process so that they can better understand it. And why we don't have more courses like that, why we expect someone with a beautiful directing mind and a beautiful image mind to just know all of that, it's not fair. It's not like it's a collaborative process. We need more access to that kind of collaborative um, training, in my opinion. Here's a shameless plug for what I do. Um, the Limestone District School Board has something called Focus Programs, and we have one called Studio LC, and that's what we do all day with kids. It's that they, they come and they make films, and I teach the acting for the cool. camera part, and the critical media literacy, and I understand exactly what you're saying, which is why I have that quick, visceral reaction, because I try to teach kids how to have what I call EDD. Um, you know, empathy deficit disorder. So if they, if I can teach them how to have that, then the directors will see and feel what the actors need, and it becomes sort of a, a circle. So rest assured, there there are people out there doing it. There, there's lots of kids who are doing it. Awesome. We're doing stuff left, right, and center. But you're right. More people need to understand collectively what's yeah. happening and see the uh, more as a process instead of this is your part, this is your part, this is your. Film, part. film is such a collaborative mm -hmm. art. Totally, you have to be able to talk to each other and just communicate. So it's being collaborative. Oh, I've got a question. Uh, please, yeah. Um, so I'm a festival programmer in Calgary, so I have kind of an interesting funding slash art related kind of quandary. Because um, with festival programming, um, all of us have funding issues as it is. And when you notice streams of like within gay film, there are gay film stereotypes that emerge. Like I know if I put a movie with boys shirtless on a beach, that a certain audience will show up regardless of the storyline. <laughs> you know I, mean? I know that will happen. And so I find that there are these streams in um, gay and lesbian films specifically, and there's this massive influx of trans films that are all over the map, which is really interesting. But do you guys ever feel as directors or actors with funding constraints and trying to get work out there that you're pushed into like internal gay stereotypes of films in order to get messages out there, or do you push against those, or is it a balance? I think it was interesting, uh, at one festival, I can't remember what it was, but um, I had submitted uh, a film, it gotten accepted, and, but there wasn't sort of, the still of it wasn't chosen for the program, and they said, well, you're, in that scene, the actor took his shirt off, why didn't you pick a still of him with his shirt off, and I was like, I didn't think that that was important to the, <laughs> the whole message of the film. But it's interesting that maybe, you know, it, it didn't even necessarily be, it wasn't a, you know, Boys on the Beach film, but they almost want to sell it as a Boys on the Beach film, which then sort of skews the message that you may be trying to say. So it is kind of a complicated, slippery area. Well, as a, as a queer film festival goer, I actually have a rule where I don't go to the films that have shirtless yeah. boys or girls in bikinis on the beach because I, I just feel like 
those are not the films that I want to go see at the, the festival. And as a result, those are not the kinds of films that I end up working on or that I want to write. But pe people do. People go. People want to see those movies. I don't know why, but they do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do know why. I laughed hysterically about the same topic because Reload had uh, was showing a film and I can't remember the name of it, but it was something to do with uh, love something or other, and it was set in Nazi Germany. Oh. And do do you know it was a? Uh, I'm going to kick myself later, but in any case, it it's a very serious drama, and the picture that they chose to put in the guide was two shirtless guys. And in the movie, they're actually brothers <laughs> changing. <laughs> that has nothing to do with the film whatsoever. It was appallingly funny. Like, I was mortified. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, we need to make money too, right? We, we, uh, a, f a film festival, admission alone is probably 10% of our revenue, if that. Um, and so, uh, you know, dragging people out to films, especially films where people feel entitled that it becomes their festival, whether it be a queer festival or imaginative, where you, you take ownership of that and you want to see your community represented. And unfortunately, I mean, where the queer community, at least the, the, the sexual orientation side of things, is, is a lot to do with sex. And so sex sells, I mean, especially, especially in our... Well, not to bash, I mean, entertainment has a place pop, you know, uh, popcorn, entertainment, films, rom-coms, like, you know, you can't just programs, you know, only really dark or heavy stuff. You have to obviously be open. I'd like to see more comedies. I think there's so many comedies. No, I mean really good ones. I like to see more dramas. <laughs> it's got to be also, though, about what people are ready to see, you know, and I mean, a film that, I, I, I made a film that was about sort of like the affective and emotional impacts of transition within intimate relationships. And I remember reading one of the first reviews that was, was all about how she helped him through the surgeries. <laughs> <laughs> Not a thing about bodies in the film whatsoever, <laughs> right? But it was a really great like litmus test of what people want to see or what people were expecting out of a film like that. And granted, it wasn't true. Um, but there's a reason why like, the same types of stories get programmed, you know? In sort of my world, it's called like the trans narrative. It's the like, I was born in the wrong body and now I feel so much better. Right? That narrative isn't actually true. Not that any narratives are really all that true, but... So we need to, you know, I as an artist try to push back against that by making different kinds of work. And then, you know, you keep making different kinds of work and eventually that work gets programmed. But it does, I mean, it is contingent upon like what people are seeing and what people are wanting to see. Yes. Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I work within a youth group, say out loud in, in Belleville, and I think part of what happens is, as <clears throat> the artists and creators mature, they've been there, done that, and yet for young people, when they're looking for the shirtless teens on the beach, that is their, that's what they need to see. They need to see two guys who are in love, and yada, 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 the puppies, and all that kind of stuff. And they'll grow into the more serious uh, stuff later on, right? So, yeah, I can see all how difficult it is to sort of program for the, the wide audience. And I mean, when I, I was here a bit late, but when I look in the room for a youth program workshop, there's not many youth in the room. And so, how do we reach those people? I mean, I was hoping that a bus would bring them down from Belleville, but they're obviously not here. And so, um, yeah, that's part of the whole piece about who we're speaking to and how we're, the language we use and yep. the visuals and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that goes back to your initial question, I think, in terms of what is one of the hardest challenges of doing what we do. And part of that is how do we balance needing to get bums in the seats with the programming that we actually want to be making because there is this commercial element, there is this image, imagistic, clear connection that isn't that, like sometimes runs counter to what our films are actually meant to be about, right? In order to bring people in, is there, you know, do we sacrifice to that? And it's a very good question. 
But it, again, you can also, like, you just never know where those films are going to play or what's going to happen anyways. Yeah. Like, like with, with this film that we're here with now, Liar, this is the second queer festival it's played. And I remember when I was making it, I was like, I don't know if anyone's going to play this film, but it's just going to kill the queer festival circuit. Like, it's going to play all of them. We got turned down from everywhere, but it, we got into a bunch of, like, really competitive international festivals. Yeah. But, like, queer programmers looked at it and they're like, this is uncomfortable and ambiguous. We're not sure how our audience is going to feel about right. this. <laughs> so, so, and so it, didn't, or it, yeah, so it became uh, a film that programmers were uncertain was for their audience, even though, as a filmmaker, I was like, I'm making this for this audience that it's going to do great. No idea. What's, what's your question? I just, I find it interesting because I agree with you. Um, I run a youth group media program with my festival, and the interesting thing is the kids will go to the highly commercialized films, but when they come to me and they want to make films, they want to make intense, soul ripping lots of with glitter, like it's really tiny. So like they want to create these really, really like integrity rich, beautiful projects that are not the things they're gonna watch on, yeah. on the screen, which is just bizarre. It's like this weird dichotomy. But these are the same kids who will like go to the commercial film but make these incredibly personal, really intense, like really intense films. So I think there's this. I think queer film festivals are an opportunity for this beautiful balance. And the other thing I know I tell my program committee and the kids all the time is that we're such a new medium authentically new. I think there's so many stories that haven't been told yet that I'm really I'm concerned to see stereotypes in programming um, develop because I don't want to mainstream the opportunity the opportunity for queer film because there's we're just it's, we're like this very, very small fish in this huge pond um, of content. And you're right, I mean the for a perfect example, uh, Boondock Saints with Willem Dafoe's character waking up beside a man and it's never mentioned in the film. It's just like, oh he's gay and they never talk about it. But that leaves people in the queer community going <laughs> Why don't we talk about it? And then, yeah. so it's this weird balance of like, queer film is a challenge, and I, that's why I love it. But yeah, I do find that wrong. And if that film was made yeah. now, it might be different. Yeah, that would be. Oh, that's a pretty old film. Mm -hmm. Well, and is there a responsibility in terms of like, because one thing that our films come up against is queer film festivals saying, well, it's not gay enough, yes. and straight film festivals saying, it's too gay. Yeah. And you, start to go, like, no. you start to go, like, well, first of all, what does that mean? Yeah. Second of all, like, so, so I'm sorry, we need to develop a somewhere in the middle sexuality genre, mm -hmm. like in terms of like how much, like, what is that based on? Like, there's no criteria for that, so it's still being felt out. And I, I've been to five festivals with this film so far, and one, interestingly, the one where the audience was like the most interested was a fairly integrated, it was in Palm Springs, where there's a very strong queer community, but a very strong queer and straight film-going community. And it was the one where we were packed all the time because both because both groups were represented and interested and loved film, right? And it wasn't being targeted to one or the other because this is what happens: is it's like, well, are you this or are you that? And who actually falls in specifically to A or B in anything? You know, I feel like like the quote unquote straight media right now does want queer in all of their things. Yeah, but they don't even want this. Much. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. now it's becoming more okay and more acceptable. Yeah, but don't quit making my supporting lead gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why I shout out Joss Whedon who did, but like, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, totally. It's like the gay best friend stereotype <laughs> as opposed to a gay lead, right? Yeah. And then we're okay exactly. with that. We're cool with that, right? yeah. Which I guess is still progression, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't. So what is the right kind of gay? <laughs> <laughs> supporting lead gay. <laughs> you had a question? No, I just, I, um, I'm curious about how you, how you, how as an industry, we can reconcile these things because we don't want. Uh, what I'm hearing is that you know, for queer-oriented uh, films, to not be marketed as just that, as a, as, a, as a film about queer people. But then at the same time, we want to explore when there is a queer situation in a straight film. I, I think there's a, there's a bit of a chasm between those things where I'm, I'm just curious actually, what is the dividing line and how do you bring those two things together? Where it becomes more integrated into the quote unquote mainstream, but at the same time doesn't become this huge issue where it's like, okay, we really need to explain why he's gay and why he's waking up next to a man. You know, just to give you an example. So it's, I, it's, it's, it's a question, really. I personally am totally fine calling my film a lesbian drama. Like, I don't, it's a drama, but I'm cool with saying it's a lesbian drama. It is, it is. I'm proud and happy that it stars lesbians, yay. Like, I don't know. Um, that's my opinion, though. And that might change. 
I think it's interesting to look, I mean, mainstreaming is happening in a variety of ways, right? And so, James, what you're bringing up here is a mainstreaming in queer cinema. So there becomes a mainstreaming of certain narratives that therefore are being pushed up against by experimental and more avant-garde avant -garde filmmakers, which is exactly what's happening in mainstream you know, cinema cultures as well. And so what we're looking at is this normative typecasting that will then be taken over again by the next generation of the new normative, right? And so I think in some ways, you, we've just got to watch the politics of the, the experimental and the new guard because that's what's going to keep pushing. You know, it's really, there's no end to that cycle. In my opinion. So we have about four minutes left. So for anybody who hasn't spoken yet, is there anything you'd like to say? Or haven't spoken, you know, I just want to try to balance out the, does anybody want to say anything? If you could, you know, say one thing to a youth, young filmmaker or, if there's something that you need or want, what would you say? I, I would just say, I mean, if, if you want to make films, um, a lot of people uh, think that they have to go to film school. You know, I went to film school. You don't have to go to film school. You, you can learn so much mm -hmm. just from watching films, uh, watching as much as you can of every type of film. I think we tend to only look uh, to, or only want to watch films that, that uh, um, are the type of films that we want to make or something. Right. But you can learn so much from watching, you know, such a wide variety of films and, and reading about film and, and uh, yeah. So I would just try to, you know, open. Be yeah, open. be really, really open to to learning really lots of different advice. sources. Yeah. So I think I don't know when I'm casting. I just find sometimes the talent just comes out of the kids who didn't go to film school. The, yeah. kid, the kids who can just be in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. I, that would be my advice. Just be. Don't act. Just, just become that person. Like, I, I can't act, so I can't really <laughs> say, but I find those actors that are just like, at 17, they're just so innately talented, they have no acting background. Maybe they've watched a lot of movies. They're just present in themselves. But they're just, they're just very themselves on camera. It's, it's beautiful to see. Then, just seriously, don't take no for an answer. I had attended a, like a pitching session, so a pitch to script, that I've been working on for quite a few years. And uh, everyone I went to said, no, don't do it. Don't make it, it's your first film, you're too close to the subject matter, it's not going to work, you're, you'll be disappointed, and so I walked away thinking, oh yeah, maybe they're right, yeah. No. No, why would I not do it? If I don't do it now, then it's still going to be my first film ten years from now, after I've gone and done other stuff, so <laughs> exactly. what the hell's the difference? So, it's now done. So. Good, cool. What's it called, Kelly Marie? It's called Smart Work. Cool. Yeah, it's I a short don't doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a short story based on a, a short film based on a short story my grandfather wrote. Oh, cool. So it's um, in the final post production phase now. Cool. Anything else? Um, I know this was already a little talked about at the beginning, but I read an article by Jenna Fisher, the girl from The Office, and I really liked her piece of advice oh, for yeah. actors was when she first started off, it was she didn't say no to any role and like she would go from being the lead of a feature film to a one-liner in the next film and it was just all about the networking with the people on that crew and that cast and the experience that you take away from all that and the footage mm -hmm. to build your demo reel. It's really like don't say no to any opportunity unless it's, unless yeah. it's absolutely terrible. I can juggle this chainsaw. I can do yeah. it. <laughs> get in the way when you begin. You yeah, know? well, yeah. For sure. like perseverance, is, especially with acting, is such a big thing. I was reading, um, you remind me of uh, an article I read in The Hollywood Reporter a little while ago. They were interviewing um, a lot of the actresses who were being considered for uh, Best Actor nominations, and um, and it was just such a humbling conversation because Naomi Watts was saying that she had struggled in Hollywood for 10 years and was about to quit before she got cast in Mulholland Drive uh, by David Lynch and that was like he saw something in her that no one else saw but for 10 years she was like driving around and wanting to quit and you know now she's like you know a huge star but you wouldn't think that she had struggled for 10 years before. Yeah, you don't hear those stories you always no. hear about yeah. that I don't know Hollywood you know overnight you an overnight, overnight success no you weren't an overnight success you struggled for 10 years but, well let's yeah. not talk about that because nobody wants to hear that nobody wants to talk about those things we just want to hear that you know you're a glorious star now yeah. but it's true. I would yes. say to my kids, you are famous. Now go show the world. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and also, I think.
think a big thing is be the best possible person that you can be and make that a priority. Make, make being a good person who has strong values and who treats people well a priority because it's a nasty, it can be a very nasty industry that will, and I, I, sometimes I feel bad talking to you because I'm like, you I know what I really think? <laughs> in my experience, it's going to kick you in the teeth over and over again and what you don't want to lose at the end of the day is the person that you could have been in all the other parts of your life. When you go on set, you treat everyone like you want to be treated and that's not a cliche, that's a truism that has to exist and people will remember you and people will want to work with you and, but that can't be the priority. The priority has to be to be the person that you want to be and not sacrifice that to the hardships you experience in the career. And I think that's true. Any career, it should be human knowledge, but it's get, it gets tested over and over again in this industry. So maintain that person. Be excellent to each other. Don't yeah. gauge your success by fame yeah. ever as an actor, I would say. Like how proud were you of your last film? That's how you should be gauging your success. Well, I'd just like to thank all of you so much for sharing your time and your energy and your intelligence. I have to have to look up some of those words. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for coming, and thanks Real at 14 for, for being so spectacular. And thank thanks to Maddie for all the maps. But Davenport would mean living up north, which would be awesome. But now you have me thinking bullshit, like, what if my future wife's gonna be attending Robinson in fucking Toronto? I thought you didn't even believe in fate. Destiny is just an excuse for lazy people. Hard work equals good life, the end. I have to go. This is what I've been working towards my entire existence. Get good grades, attend good schools, <laughs> be good writer. You just weren't writing for the right people, that's why you didn't do well. They contacted you. They like your script. They want you to intern. What's up writing on your arms? It's so I don't forget about stuff that I want to write about later. My arm's attached. Better chance I won't lose it. If they like it, I should be able to buy us a bigger house. Maybe build a basement apartment for your mom. Well, that wouldn't be much of an issue if you weren't so loud. As long as you're my subject. The alternate. You just think that because you love me. Anymore, do you? No, never. I do believe me is Stark. Ryan Stark. I want to ask. Oh, look, I do see one. It's an ostrich giving birth to a hippopotamus. <laughs> You're an idiot. I'm an idiot. Yeah, you are. The cold stares from your sharp shoulder blades, hot glares from your cheap shot charades. What the fuck, Maddie? This is none of your business. Butt out. You know what, Ryan? It's my business. I just want to say that... I don't care what you have to say. Just fucking leave now. Corey, can you please just forgive me? Nothing. I have an essay due tomorrow. I'll start it again. Do, do you think I'm an idiot? I can't do this anymore. Keep trying. Okay? Just keep trying. But you're happy. Completely. 
So you're happy? Yes. I'm ecstatic. Do I make you happy? Hot glares from your cheek, shot charade.